Hello everyone, bring you a video today which was somewhat inspired by a recent comment on another video. I thought the idea was a good one and I thought it was worth pursuing. So what we're looking at in this video is a recreation of a British infantryman in the winter of 1939-40, training in France during the Phony War period, and then looking at a British infantryman very late in the war, the winter of 1944-45, specifically a man of 3rd Infantry Division, fighting through the Low Countries in Germany around this time period. Now, this is somewhat contrived to show the greatest change possible. Not every man got a Mark III helmet, which is something we're going to look at in the video, of course. But it's nevertheless interesting to look at the difference which had been wrought between how the British infantryman looked in 1939 and how he looked at the end of the war. And that's the point of this video, really, is to look at some of the kit changes which had happened and some of the bits and pieces which were consistent through the period. So that's what we're going to look at in this video. We'll get into having a look at the two recreations now. Naturally enough, we'll first of all look at the recreation of a British infantryman from 1939. And as you can see here, the equipment and so forth aside, the look of British infantrymen at this time was not that dissimilar from how they'd looked at the end of the Great War. And indeed, British infantry in France at this time were training for a similar type of defensive warfare, with at least some of the doctrine definitely drawing on experience from the Great War. As you can see, the weapon carried here is the standard British Army rifle of this time, the number one Mark III Star, which was, of course, a simplified version of the number one Mark III, which had been introduced early during the Great War. Looking at the uniform, we'll start at the top as we normally do, and you can see here the Mark II steel helmet, a newly introduced design. Although visually similar to the Mark I helmet introduced during the Great War, the Mark II represented a combination of new features, some very obvious, such as a newly designed liner and chin strap, some features less obvious, such as the non-magnetic rim and chin strap securing lugs. The basic uniform worn here still consists of service dress, although the cut had been modified in the interwar years. You'll notice in contrast to the Great War, where a great deal of battle insignia had been introduced, battle patches and so forth, there's no insignia worn here. We don't even have rank, of course, this being a private. And this is very typical of the early years of the war, where some developments were made in terms of battle patches and so forth, with troops deployed to France, but it was very common to see a real lack of insignia. During the winter of 1939-40, it's also very common to see the leather jerkin worn for extra warmth, and you can see that here. Quite a popular cold weather garment, and as we'll see, a garment worn right the way through the Second World War. Before we look at the web equipment, we'll take a quick look at some of the anti-gas equipment here, and you can see on the chest we have a Mark V respirator haversack, and this contains a general service respirator, a design very similar to the small box respirator introduced during the Great War in that it has a separate canister, a hose, and then a face piece. And this is carried in the same alert position up on the chest so that the short hose extending from the face piece can reach the canister carried in the haversack. The web equipment is the bang up to date 1937 pattern. You can see one of the basic pouches here at the front. Of course, not only designed to carry rifle ammunition in bandoliers, grenades, etc. These are primarily designed with the British Army's new light machine gun in mind, the Bren, with its box magazines. Looking at the left hip, we can see the bayonet for the rifle is carried. The water bottle is not carried on the hip in this instance, very common to see in photographs of this time period. So looking to the rear, we can see the haversack is carried up on the shoulders, and this not only contains the oblong mess tins, which nest together and fit neatly into a compartment within, it also carries the water bottle in this instance. And this is something discussed further in the recent video uploaded looking at early issue 1937 pattern. You'll note the omission of the ground sheet here, which could be carried rolled and folded underneath the flap of the haversack, simply to say that the photographs of men trading in France in the winter of 1939-40, which I've based this on, show that the ground sheet was omitted in this instance, presumably left with the pack in unit transport. Looking at the back of the equipment here, something to note which is missing is an entrenching tool. The British Army went to war in 1939 without an issue entrenching tool, and this would be rectified with an interim design, the 1939 pattern, and then with the reintroduction of the two-part entrenching tool which had been issued during the Great War. But neither of these two designs was on issue in 1939. Looking above the haversack, we can see that the anti-gas cape is carried here, the tapes have been looped under the arms, crossed over the cape to hold it in place, and they're then tied to the D-rings on the respirator haversack. The final thing to consider here is footwear, and you can see here the standard general service boots, or ammo boots, issued to the British Army at the time. Black pebble grain leather ankle boots with a toe case, as you can see here. These had been first introduced during the 1920s and were standard issue by this time. In a fashion similar to the Great War, these are worn with long putties, 
although they aren't wound quite as far up the leg as was common to see during the Great War. So there we are, that's an overview of some basic kit from 1939, say specifically based on the winter of 1939-40 in fact, with the inclusion of the leather jerk in there as a form of cold weather garment. We'll move on now to consider something of a direct comparison in terms of troops in Europe during the winter months, but looking at the beginning of 1945. The recreation here is of a private in the 3rd Infantry Division. Beyond that, it's not possible to determine the specific brigade or position within the brigade, or indeed the regiment, and we'll get on to talking about why that's the case when we look at the insignia that's worn here. In contrast to the previous recreation, the weapon carried here is the Rifle No. 4. This was a design which had been considered for introduction prior to the outbreak of the Second World War, but even as the war progressed, it would not completely replace the Rifle No. 1 Mark III star in all theatres, though it was standard in Northwest Europe during the latter years of the war. Looking at the uniform and starting at the top, as usual, we have another contrast here, a Mark III steel helmet. This was again a design introduced during the war to provide improved protection compared with the Mark II. The Mark III had certainly not replaced the Mark II by the end of the war, but it's an interesting contrast to make here, given the very different shape of this helmet. The basic uniform now consists of battle dress, which was a very different uniform from service dress, although the details are not particularly clear to see here because the leather jerkin is again being worn. But battle dress was formed of a short blouse and trousers, similar to 1930s skiing suits, and that's worn here in place of the service dress. The battle dress suit is still made of the same drab wool serge, but it's a more modern, more up-to-date cut of uniform for the field, certainly by the standards of the 1930s and 1940s. As already said, this is worn again with the leather jerkin, a point of consistency between the two recreations here. Again, the leather jerkin is still very commonly seen in the winter of 44-45, a very popular cold weather garment, quite a practical one as well. The insignia was mentioned briefly before, and you can see here the formation sign of the 3rd Division. This time there was a range of other insignia, including regimental shoulder titles and armour service strips. It's not uncommon late in the war to see just the divisional formation sign worn as we have here. Men were being moved around between battalions and it's been postulated that this is the reason for this, with the regimental shoulder titles and the armour service strips removed due to being moved around within the division, leaving only the divisional formation sign which we have here. You'll notice we've lost the respirator haversack from the chest. If a respirator was carried at this time, it would generally speaking be the light anti-gas respirator, which had a canister attached to the face piece, which negated the need to carry the haversack up on the chest. In this instance, even that has been dispensed with to save on weight. The threat of gas attack, certainly by this time in the war, was not deemed to be sufficient for the respirator to be carried, and they were often dispensed with. The web equipment is again the 1937 pattern, although there are some changes here. You might have noticed that the basic pouches are riding much higher on the belt, those used with the 1939 recreation being Mark 1s, the ones shown here are Mark 3s, which not only sit higher on the belt, but are also slightly enlarged to allow Sten machine carbine magazines to be carried. One other detail to mention when looking at the web equipment here is the difference in colour. The 1939 recreation we looked at was using number 97 Blanco, and this 1945 recreation is using KG3 Blanco. An interesting feature to note is the GS shovel tucked behind the left-hand basic pouch, this is a surprisingly comfortable way to carry the shovel and is quite commonly seen amongst the men of 3rd Div at this time. As we'll see, an entrenching tool does form part of this equipment, but there really is no replacement for a proper full-sized shovel when it comes to digging in. On the left hip, we can see a 1937 pattern bayonet frog modified to allow the spike bayonet for the number 4 to be carried. You can see this has been achieved by working a second hole into the top loop of the bayonet frog, and this has been modified at unit level with blanket stitching around the edge to create this extra hole. On the right hip, we can now see the water bottle carried on the hip, and this is carried in a full length sleeve type carrier, as you can see here, still the venerable felt covered enamel water bottle. Looking to the rear, we can see the haversack is again carried up on the shoulders. This is the primary way that 1937 pattern was supposed to be used with the haversack carried on the back in battle order. We can also see underneath the haversack the gas cape is carried. This has been tied to the back of the belt. At this point, as opposed to its intended role, it was not only being used as a waterproof, but also as a lightweight ground sheet as well. Below this, in addition to the shovel, we can see that the two-part entrenching tool is carried. And as mentioned in 1939, the British Army did not have an issue entrenching tool. They initially moved to the 1939 pattern, and then, in 1941, reintroduced the two-part entrenching tool which had been used during the Great War, and that's carried here, as you can see. 
Moving down, we can see that the boots are again the general service or ammo boot, but these are no longer worn with putties. You can see here the ubiquitous anklets associated with the 1937 pattern web equipment. These particular examples are of mid-war manufacture, and as you can see, they have leather straps. And as a concession to economy, the buckles are not in fact made of brass in this instance, they are made of sheridized steel. So there we are, that's a look at a recreation of British infantrymen in 1945. We'll just compare this here again to 1939 and back to 1945, just to give you a visual representation of some of the changes which occurred. Some of these changes would occur very early in the war, of course, such as the switch to battle dress uniform, anklets and so forth, in preference to putties, and some of them would take longer to take effect. And it's important to note that, of course, some men would see the war through wearing items such as the Mark II steel helmet. But this does show some of the stark changes which did take place during the war in terms of changes to kit, the way the British soldier looked. So there we are. I hope you found it interesting looking at those two recreations side by side. I certainly found it interesting putting this together and it's allowed me opportunity to go and have a good dig through the collection again, which is always enjoyable. If you found it interesting and you'd like to see more from the channel, then please do consider subscribing if you haven't already. And whether you're newly subscribing or you've previously subscribed, please do make sure you hit the little bell, the little notification button down below. That will of course alert you when I upload future videos. If you really like my uploads and you'd like to support the channel, you can. There's both Patreon and PayPal linked down below. And a massive thank you to everybody who supports the channel using those two methods. It really is greatly appreciated, as I always say. If you'd like to follow the channel on social media and see the photographs used in this video in more detail, there's Facebook, Instagram and Twitter all linked down below. If you'd like to make contact but you don't really use social media, there is, of course, an email address down there as well. But that's everything for this video. So until next time, bye for now.